Welcome to the future, you guys. Today we have a jam-packed episode. I have three of my good friends joining us today for a panel discussion. This is not one of those shorter episodes. This is gonna be a long, lengthy discussion and we're gonna get uh, an opportunity for you guys to get your questions in via YouTube Live. So make sure you guys are tuned in to that. We're packed full house here today, guys. What are we gonna be talking about today? We're gonna be talking about the state of motion design education. Before we do that, I just wanna bring something up. I wanna talk about tuition and probably one of the reasons why we're even having this conversation in the first place. Now, Joey Corman, who's online right now, he's just kind of waiting in the wings. He helped me to pull up some of these numbers. This is what it costs currently, based on our best available Google search, what it costs to go per semester. So Ringling, 21,000, SCAD, 18, Pratt and Rizzi top in the charts with CalArts at $24,000 a semester. All of a sudden, it makes Art Center look pretty affordable, as well as Otis, SVA is 20K. Now, Joey did some fancy mo mo graph motion graphics math here, and he told me that when you add it all up, including your living expenses and everything that it takes to get through school, you're gonna be in debt about $350,000. Did I get that number right, Joey? That's the total price tag, including the interest on student loans. Oh, but yes, interest. more or less, you're okay. correct, yeah. It's even more than that, actually, if you calculate everything else that's involved. Right. Okay, fantastic. Well, well, inevitably then, somebody will say, well, you get what you pay for, right? Well, if you make it worth more, like the value is greater, then the price is justified. I'm not so sure about that. We're going to talk about that. So, of course, it makes us wonder, are, are there alternatives? And I think most definitely there are alternatives. So let's meet the panel today. First up is Joey Corman. He runs the School of Motion. And then there's Nick Campbell in a much more flattering shirt and a smile on that man's face with Grayscale Gorilla. He's the gorilla himself. And last but not least, Michael Jones is on live with us today. He runs two companies, MoGraph Mentor and something brand new called Create Academy. And we're going to talk about all that stuff. Erica, please roll the titles. We did it. We made it. We're live. Nothing has crashed yet. This is fantastic. Guys, let's bring yourselves online. I want to ask you guys this first question. And it's the easiest question that I can ask you. What's your why? Why did you start what you started? That's Tell us it, a little huh? bit. Yeah, we'll just go around the room. Joey, since you were introduced first, why don't you go and then we'll get to Nick and then Michael. Uh, my why, I think Personally, everything I do is, you know, for my family. I know that's really cheesy, but so uh, cheesy. I have a beautiful wife. <laughs> I have three beautiful children. Um, so really everything in my life is sort of organized around that. Um, I'd say professionally, my why has, has changed as School of Motion's grown. And now really um, a lot of what I think about and what I try to do is really for my team. Mm -hmm. um, that, that helps me with School of Motion. We've got this amazing team of uh, full-time people and, and, and part-time, um, you know, assistants and contributors and stuff like that. Um, and our students who, um, you know, are now legion. <laughs> um, and I've gotten to meet a bunch of them in person. So it's really, it's all, it's really about people, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me yeah. reframe the question because you didn't give me the answer I was looking for. I, I just wanted to know, <laughs> why did you start School of Motion? What was the impetus? The catalyst? Good question. It's, it's interesting you ask me that because Nick Campbell is on this right, live stream. Right. <laughs> He's one of the big inspirations behind it. Um, so, so I'll try to be brief. There's a few reasons. Uh, so one is I just personally wasn't really fulfilled anymore in what I was doing at the time. I was a creative director at a motion design studio in Boston that, that I had helped start. Um, and the, the grind and the stress and, and the heartache um, that I was dealing with every day for many, many reasons it just felt like it wasn't a good fit anymore. Um, and I got really interested in other business models um, and I was really fascinated by what Nick was doing. This was right at the beginning of Grayscale Gorilla and I saw how much fun he seemed to be having, um, you know, sort of teaching people and sharing what he learned as he was learning it and just basically being really helpful to the community. Um, and so I kind of wanted in on that. So uh, that's kind of where it started. And since then, as we've, you know, sort of figured out our, our business model and made classes and, and had some success, um, it's kind of morphed into, you know, I really feel like we have this this opportunity and almost like a responsibility now to um, provide a good education that's affordable and really effective and available to people in countries where there's no other options. Um, and it's really become more of like a it feels more like a mission mm. to me, mm -hmm. than it did at the beginning. 
Okay, lovely. So yeah. the, the the key takeaway here is you saw what Nick was doing. You liked what he was doing. You're like, hey, I think I could do that. Let's do that. <laughs> well, I think that's a perfect segue then to bring Nick on the line. Nick, what is up, man? I want to ask uh, you the man, same question, okay? Yeah, thanks for having me, man. My pleasure. Uh, same question. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm honored, by the way, Joey. I, I, I had a similar kind of thing with, you know, Andrew Kramer and... <laughs> Uh, you know, Brian Maffitt and other teachers that were online doing great stuff. But for me, you know, it was really similar to to, to Joey, um, why I started Grayscale Gorilla. It was, you know, I wasn't 100% happy in my career. I thought I wanted to be a motion designer, ended up working at um, Digital Kitchen in Chicago. And while I loved learning and I loved playing with all the tools and and seeing how far I could push myself, the the client stuff was, was starting to wear on me. And I just wanted to kind of experiment. And I've always... I've always, my favorite people were always my teachers. And so growing up, you know, I always loved learning. And when I really connected with a teacher, it, it helped me so much. So as I started uh, learning Cinema 4D, so there's a lot of little points to it, but as I started learning Cinema 4D, uh, a magical website started uh, appearing online called uh, YouTube. <laughs> and, <laughs> Tell and, me more and, about and this video. magical website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine a world where there was no YouTube and Vimeo, and, that, and I. So I had to learn Cinema 4D and After Effects through either DVDs or you had to go to art. Or I went to also went to art school, and um, or I, or I found VHS tapes and DVDs. And there's just no easy way to learn. And so once I saw YouTube, I saw what Andrew Kramer was doing, and I knew that I wanted to teach um, and just learn and teach for a living. So I saw an opportunity with Grayscale Grill, and I said, What if I just learned motion design and cinema 4d and after effects for a living and then taught everything i knew for a living mm. and so that's kind of how it started and um now you know 10 years we celebrate our 10 year anniversary next Woo, year congratulations and, on that uh, so now you know there's there's other parts of it like bringing in other teachers and other uh, you know, the last thing i'll say about it is i think people connect with certain teachers the same way that i connected with only a small amount of teachers, but the ones that I connected with made such a huge impact. Mm -hmm. And so what I realized was I could bring in other teachers into what we're doing and try to find more connections for our students. So for me, it was just the love of teaching and the love of learning. Wow. Are we getting some lag here, you guys? Are you guys seeing that lag? Yeah. Just a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, cool. At least lag. we got to hear Nick. He was pretty clear, but there was some displacement between what you said and your mouth moving. Okay. Fantastic. I put a bunch of uh, I put a bunch of redshift filters on my <laughs> webcam. <laughs> so. That's what's down. killing it right now. He's got a lot on there. <laughs> Still rendering. Fantastic. So it's very interesting. So Joey is inspired by Nick. Nick's inspired by Andrew and Brian Moffat, who I both looked at in terms of trying to up my motion graphics or animation game myself. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you very much for sharing that story. Last but not least, Michael Jones. I want to throw the same question to you. What's your why? Why did you start the company that you started? Yeah. Um, you know, I think at that time, my goal was just to be useful. And I was learning a lot from people like Nick and uh, Andrew Kramer. So we have kind of like a Russian doll MoGraph situation. <laughs> <laughs> Kramer all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Andrew's somewhere at the bottom of that, the tiny doll. But um, <clears throat> no, I, I think I wanted to be useful. I think I wanted to fill in a gap. There was a lot of uh, on-demand content that was free. I thought um, I had done mentorship programs in other disciplines, specifically character animation, animation mentor, um, which is massive and probably a lot of people have heard of it. So, um, you know, it wasn't novel, but it was just I would have these kind of like obsessive conversations with my wife and with other people of, um, we, we really should do that in motion design. It would be useful. It would be fun. And, um, I think I've told the story before that I was, you know, I waited like a couple years of like, well, you know, it's such an obvious idea. Somebody else will do it. Uh, but then eventually it was like, well, why don't we just put it together? And, um, you know, honestly, I, I just kind of tested the waters with like the first 10, 15 emails to really great designers and animators and, you know, they, they were all so receptive to doing it that it made it really easy to put it together and organize it. So, um, you know, just just the goal of being useful and trying to like fill in a gap within the context of everything else that was that was already available. How long ago did you start MoGraph Mentor? <laughs> I'm trying to get a timeline here. So Nick started it 10 years ago with Grayscale Gorilla. Yeah, we uh, we rolled out the marketing in late 2013. 
So, so it's like five right years. Around five years. Okay. Yeah. And Joey, what about you? How long have you been doing School of Motion? Uh, so the site's about five and a half years old, but we didn't actually run any classes for the first two years. So the classes are really only three and a half years old. Three and a half. So what did yeah. you do with the site for two years or whatever? Uh, well, it started as just a, a blog doing um, tutorials and, and trying to figure things out. And I actually sold a Cinema 4D plugin for a while. I did say Nick was in his <laughs> uh, Yeah, so we, we sort of tried literally just like doing what Nick was doing at first. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Maxon ended up releasing a new version that broke my plugin, and I realized oh, I'm no. out of this plugin business. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's super cool. All right, uh, I'm gonna take this opportunity to tell you guys why I started uh, the future and why we're doing what we're doing. It's a story I don't tell that often to that many people, so here's my why. Some of you guys know this, I taught at Art Center for over 15 years and at, at Otis for about 10 years. And I was having a great time. I loved working with students. Nothing is more invigorating than sharing something that you know and seeing that little spark in somebody's eye when it clicks in their mind like, wow, that's what I need to do. And I love that part of it. But here's the thing, one night after teaching, I'm driving home from Pasadena to the Palisades and my wife turns to me, she's like, you know, you did a great job teaching. I'm like, wow, that was, that's cool, thanks. And she said, but, I don't know if you're living up to your full potential. And this took me, this just caught me off guard. I was like, what do, you, what do you mean I'm not living up to my potential? She said, here's the thing. Semester after semester, you teach the same thing to a very small group of people who as tuition goes up, it becomes out of reach for normal people. So these are quite privileged people. I think you need to do something much bigger than this. And it bothered me listening to this. And we drove home kind of in silence the rest of the drive home. And I'd been thinking about it. So it would just so happen that certain factors in my life, the, the uh, reacquaintance with my friend Jose, this magical place called YouTube, that all these forces conspired to create the future. In the very beginning, what we did was we created content without any real plan in terms of monetization. It wasn't about to build plugins or even teach courses. I just wanted to try to create something that would help other people. And that little thing has grown into this super cool thing, what you guys see before you. So that's my story there. Okay. Next question for you guys, and I want to encourage you guys, this should be a dialogue between the four of us and we're trying to do it. Let's just pretend we're on stage, that the four of us are just sitting next to each other and we're allowed to ask each other questions. I have a rough outline, but that doesn't even matter. We're, I'm here and we can talk about anything you guys want to talk about, okay? Love it. Okay. Next question for you guys, uh, and let's go in reverse order this time. What makes you unique? What makes MoGraph Mentor unique, Michael? I think what makes it unique is the amount of one-on-one -on -one time that you do spend with these various designers and animators. Um, you know, I think um, we're, I feel like I'm seeing other things pop up that are kind of similar, so maybe it's not as unique now as it was five years ago, but, um, you know, it's, I, I often have to warn our mentors of, like, it gets pretty intimate. Like in these small group settings, you're really gonna get to know these people. It's not just going to be a discussion about design and animation. It's also what's going on in people's lives. It all just kind of comes out. It's really holistic. And uh, sometimes interaction with, uh, with other human beings can be messy and sometimes things go awry. So it's also quite unpredictable versus kind of like the on-demand stuff we sell, you know, that just kind of like hums along and people use it, they use it to, to varying degrees, but, um, you know, MoGraph Mentor requires kind of a constant reevaluation of who the instructors are, how, how are they feeling, what's going on in their lives, and um, I think it's just, you know, kind of the human connection aspect that, um, you know, I feel like the future is doing that pretty, pretty well now um, as well, but I think it makes MoGraph Mentor a little bit unique. Michael, <clears throat> quick request. If you can just do me a favor and look right down the barrel of your camera. There you okay, go. Okay, yeah, I've got the screen, yeah. Yeah, because you're looking down Why somewhere not? else and it looks like you don't want to talk to us. <laughs> no, okay. no, that's not the case. So stare down the barrel of that lens. So there may be people who are tuning in who have never heard of MoGraph Mentor. So can you describe it to people just in real down-to-earth, like super basic? How is it structured? Is it online? Is it in person? How do you do it? How many students and teachers? Give us the breakdown. Yeah, MoGraph Mentor is an online uh, motion graphics mentorship where you sign up in a three-month commitment. So you do a 
two to three hour session once a week, every week for 12 weeks. And it's all project based. You're going to be designing, animating, storyboarding, art directing, editing, sound design, uh, creating original pieces of work. We want to see what ideas you bring to the table, what things you're interested in. Um, and we tailor it around, you know, the portfolio that you need to build for the type of career that you want to have. We offer three classes in our mentorship program. So if you went through the entire thing, you would spend a year with us and you'd spend right around $6,000. Uh, and the goal is to help you build your technical, your artistic and your professional aptitude so that you can move your career forward. Is it done in person or is it done online? It's all online. Okay. So create Academy, that's something that's a little different, right? Yep. Create Academy is a little bit different. Create Academy is, uh, there is an online component, but I have a, kind of an in process experiment on mm -hmm. the ground here with a brick and mortar campus here in Sarasota, Florida, uh, that works on a monthly subscription model. And we're trying to, you know, leverage the hybrid model of education, which you would use an online curriculum. So you would have a dedicated desk, go to your computer each day. Uh, follow an online curriculum, but you'd be doing it in a group setting where you check in with people um, once or twice a week. And uh, the way that I've been describing it to people here is as a portfolio school, everything is project based. You should always be creating the next project and uh, getting input from remote faculty, remote mentors, um, as well as uh, staff here on the ground. So uh, it's super new. We're still uh, kind of like getting our ducks in a row a little bit on the ground here, but that is um, what I'm trying to build with Create Academy is a viable alternative to a Ringling College of Art and Design or an art institute up the road, a place where it is really affordable, but it's in a physical campus where you can leave your house and um, experience kind of that institutional setting. Mm -hmm. I like how you're experimenting. And I think what makes you unique in this group of four here, I'm including myself in here, is the low student to teacher ratio and that it's modeled very much after traditional programs where you're doing projects and you're getting critiques and you're, you have classmates and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, Nick Campbell, your turn. What makes you unique? What makes Grayscale Gorilla unique? Yeah. So, um, we're, we're quite a bit different from, um, the traditional classroom model. Um, you know, I, my personal experience with, with art school and design school was I, I was either, um, I was either ahead of where I wanted to be in the class or I was behind where I wanted to be in the class. And it was an always a frustrating situation to be in a, like a real classroom where there was set deadlines and set things we had to learn at a certain time. And for me, and, and at least the brain, the way that my brain works was like, I knew I ne needed to learn certain things that as a part of my career. But when I was really interested in After Effects, let's say, all I wanted to do was go learn that. and. I felt like in a traditional school setting that didn't give me the ability to really like dive in. I had to like take a break and then go to an another class. And so we try to set up our learning as a way where you can kind of choose your own adventure and pick what you are really interested in and dive deep. And then when you need to go take a step back and learn typography or learn, you know, composition or some of the bigger things, we have that too, but it's not on a set schedule. So. We, we tend to make videos and tutorials as our passions drive us instead of what we think is a, like a perfect curriculum for, for a student. And at the end of the day, we, I guess the goal for us is to be as prolific as possible and make it easy for us to make videos that are energetic, that we're passionate about. Um, Cause just like I said before, like everybody that works here uh, worked in the industry and they love teaching. Those are like who we look for as as trainers. And so we encourage our teachers to, when they're excited about something or they just learn something, I think right when you learn something is sometimes the best energy to teach it. Not years later, not when you're, you know, 10, 20 years in uh, future in your, in your career and you're like some guru from the mountain. That's like a less of a um, entertaining way to teach, at least from, from our point of view. So we tend to be very loose about it and say, as soon as we learn something interesting, we want to put it out into, uh, either on our, um, YouTube or Vimeo or, or into a paid class and say, look, we, we figure this out and we want you to know it right away. Mm. So I'd say that the major thing for us is that we, um, try to, try to just share our, our, 
energy as it happens rather than plan out a curriculum. And we hope that our students, and we see this from our students, that they also follow along with us and they're passionate about this you know, new part of Cinema 4D. So we'll just flood the energy into that and bring that to our market. And then I'd say this, the other part that I think is a little bit different than traditional schooling or, or some of uh, the other classes that you guys make as well is we, uh, we leave, we try to leave our mistakes in. And, um, and I know some of you do this as well, but I think one of the major things that traditional schooling left out of the equation was preparing students that a creative career comes with a ton of dead ends. And there's so, especially in the tutorial world, there are so many tutorials that are like, hey, I'm here and I'm here to show you this perfect way to do this. And then they show you all the button clicks and they tell you the numbers to put in. And then they say, um, you know, there you go. Just do what I did and it'll look perfect. And what they're not showing is the hours and hours of butting your head into a problem or the one checkbox that you didn't click and you forgot about it. And we've all been there, right? Like as a person in, in a creative, in the creative um, like workplace, we know that it's tons of mistakes first and then finally getting around to something that's starting to look better. And so we try to keep that into our learning process and well and, and make sure people know that that's okay. That's part of the creative process. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to be clear about something in terms of your business model, because I think what makes you unique just from a structural point of view is that you have free videos on YouTube and on Vimeo, right? And then yeah. you have products, uh, tools, kits, things yep. to help make your digital life much easier. And then you also have classes. And I think I saw one on your website for Redshift. And can you talk to us a little bit about the price and the price ranges? Because I got from Michael a sense that his classes are very tailored, very small. It's about $2,000 per class and it's project based. And then it's heavy into critique and review. Tell me a little bit about the structure of your, your products. Yeah, so we have over 600 hours of free tutorials right now. If you're interested in learning 3D or learning Cinema 4D or After Effects or whatever angle you want, there's probably something on there that'll get you up and running. And so that's been 10 years of, of making these types of you know energetic tutorials to get you up and running. And then when you're ready to dive deeper into a certain subject, let's say it's the new version of Cinema 4D or Redshift, which is a popular renderer uh, that has been popping up more and more, uh, or even X Particles, uh, we have paid training for those modules and more coming so that you can really take a deep dive. It's almost like the missing manual from all of these um, pieces of software so you can have hours and hours of training to really dive into and those run between two and three hundred dollars and they're go as you uh, like watch as you want they're mm -hmm. not a structured course it's it's more videos online we do have a uh, community area where you can ask questions and, and your peers can answer and we can help answer um, but it's not a structured course where you have to do something week by week. It's more, like I said, it's more of the missing manual. Uh, so if you've ever, if you've ever like finished watching a tutorial and you're like, man, I could watch like 30 more of those tutorials. That's essentially where these um, uh, paid training come in. It's hours and hours more where you could dive really deep into a specific piece of software. Yeah, I might have missed this. Did you tell us how much the Redshift class is? The Redshift class is two ninety nine. That's very affordable very affordable yeah yeah and it's I mean, hot it's hot right, right now yeah, Redshift. Well, everybody's all about redshift right now <laughs> i yeah. so I, I know we're not talking about uh, hardware but i I, ha I bought my first uh pc in 20 years uh specifically to use redshift once i used it on a friend's machine on chris's machine or uh, not that you chris my uh uh our um uh employee um, Schmitty. chris schmidt baby <laughs> <laughs> i said look I said, I can't have you with this machine over here doing all this cool work and I, I have to participate. So I immediately got a machine. So Redshift is is awesome. We have um, a free Redshift tutorial drop in today too, I think, if you want to check it out and see what it's all about. Okay. But uh, it's 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 amazing. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to switch gears here and, and jump to Mr. Joey Corman. Joey, what makes you unique or what makes School of Motion unique? Good question. Uh, so... First, I want to say that, you know, listening to uh, Mike and Nick, I mean, I think there's there's so much in common with what we're doing, mm -hmm, too. Um, mm -hmm. Like, we all have sort of different models. But, like, I think 
at the core, what the three of us are trying to do is leverage the, and, and the same with you, Chris, like leverage the advantages of being online and leveraging the advantages of video-based learning. Because a lot of times we compare ourselves to traditional sort of in-person learning and we, and, and we say, what are the disadvantages of what we're doing? There's actually advantages to it. And I think that's what we're leveraging. So what makes School of Motion unique and I'll use the same word Michael did, it's sort of a hybrid approach. So we do the scalable thing of having, um, you know, content that sort of gets delivered on a schedule like videos. Um, we do every single class that we've made has a podcast series that goes with it. PDFs, project files, examples, things like that. Um, all of these things that students are sort of handed and, and say, you know, and then told, you know, watch this video sort of on your schedule and watch it at 2x speed if you're into that and pause it, make notes and go back and, and all those things. But then on top of that, we layer this interactivity. So every student is assigned a teaching assistant um, and our teaching assistants handle groups of students. And basically every lesson that we have in a class comes with some sort of homework assignment. So for example, in animation boot camp, we do a lesson about uh, oscillations, basically like overshooting or, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, like things where it's like a like a sine wave kind of uh, animation curve. Um, and so we'll show like an hour long lesson on that. And then our teaching assistants will get this deluge of students doing these challenges we give them. Right. Like, br you know, bring these noodles on screen and have them wiggle and show follow through and things like that. Um, and we've you know, we have a platform similar to like a frame I.O. where you can literally draw on the on the students homework and give them time code, accurate notes, things like this. We also have live student groups um, right now. We're using Facebook. And so every session of a class has a group of students that, you know, talk 24 um, seven, ask questions. Uh, our teaching assistants sort of moderate those groups. Um, and so we sort of have layered on this human element, which really we found adds a ton of motivation. Um, it helps students connect with each other better and mm -hmm. build networks, even though they're all over the world. Um, and so we're sort of in the middle of, uh, you know, in terms of the platform it, from what Nick's doing and what Mike's doing, um, you know, we have much larger class sizes. Our biggest classes may have over 200 students in them in a session. Uh, but we have multiple teaching assistants um, and we found that at, you know, the way our platform runs, that's actually a manageable size for us. Um, so, yeah, so ours is kind of like square in the middle um, between Nick and Michael. Yeah. So I think when we talked before we went online, you said it's about 30 students to one TA, right? Yeah, it depends on the class. Mm -hmm. um, so more advanced classes, we have a smaller ratio of students yeah. to TA because sometimes like for a design class, it takes a lot more work to critique a set of boards, um, but for like we have an intro to After Effects class where a lot of the critiquing is really, did you do it right or did you not do it right? Um, and so those TAs can handle more students. So it does kind of depend. Mm -hmm. And whereas Nick has built products, you've also built your own platform, right? So that you can review work and you can critique it and you're not using a bunch of uh, off the shelf software. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Over the last uh, about year and a half, two years, we've built a totally custom website. So our website, if you go to schoolmotion.com, it's not WordPress. It's literally built from scratch to do exactly what we need. Um, and, and the reason we had to do that originally, it was built on, you know, the back of like five or six different technologies duct taped together. Uh, and it sort of worked. Um, we got to a size where things were just breaking all the time. And so to give you to give you an idea, like our current session has over 900 students in it going through various classes. Um, we have, I can't remember, it's 18 or 20 teaching assistants currently active with students. Um, and so we needed a way to manage that. Um, and so I guess that's another unique thing about us is that it is a custom piece of software running the company too. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wanna prime you guys uh, for a little debate here because there is a lot of overlap between what the three of you guys do. Well, first of all, you guys are focused, I think, on the motion graphics industry, whether it be After Effects or C4D or something like that, or a hybrid of the two, whereas we kind of stay out of that ourselves. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to think about that before I ask you the question about how do you feel about rubbing up against each other and overlapping, and, and is there competition there or not, okay? But before I do that, I'm going to throw this question over to Matthew and Greg and ask them, what makes the future unique? What, what are your thoughts on that? I think where we fit in is mostly soft skills, soft skills in business. So while these guys like Grayscale Gorilla, Andrew Kramer, all of you guys, I've learned something from, you know, I, I've learned tons from you guys over the years. I think what I don't see uh, in the market, is, especially for creatives, is 
how to run a business, how to communicate with clients, how to bid your projects properly. And we're starting to see a little bit more and more of this. And I think where we come in and where we're unique is we cover that gamut. And I believe that's our niche. Mm. Greg, anything you want to add to that? I, th- I think Matt nailed it. <clears throat> um, it's a good answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really about um, sharing our experience uh, behind the work, not making the work, not the technical part of the work at all, but really everything that happens before you even start the work. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. As you guys have mentioned, uh, my panel has talked about this. There's getting uh, there's more and more competition for these guys types of tutorials. Uh, Linda, before they became LinkedIn Learning, they produce a series of tutorials. And there's a lot of people in that space. And, and being that I'm late to the game because the future's only been in existence for two years and prior to that, two years as the school, I don't want to dive into a place where I don't have expertise and there's already a lot of competition. So we made the decision, like, let's just teach people how to run their business. And we'll get into design and topography where there isn't a whole lot of that content out there anyway. So we just want to go where nobody's at. It's like the deep ocean or blue ocean strategy where if everybody's kind of hanging out over here, a strategy is just to go somewhere else and try to make your own market. Now, the danger of that is nobody could come or you actually have the entire thing for yourself and it's pretty cool. Okay, so I want to turn over to you guys, the, my panelists, and ask you, how do you feel about, I mean, we're very open and a, I think a tight-knit community of motion graphics people, but then there's the business person in you and you're like, do you guys ever look over your shoulder and like, okay, so what is Joey doing? What's Michael doing? Or what's Nick doing? Anybody? Uh, I guess start. I mean, I, I, for me personally, like, of course we do that, but um, I really do have uh, sort of like an abundance mindset, mm-hmm. as silly as that sounds. Like, um, I mean, M- Mike and I are practically neighbors at this point. We both live like within like probably 10 miles of each other and, and we've hung out and we've talked a lot and we've shared, you know, numbers and just like you and I have, yes, yeah. like we share business numbers. And it to me, it really feels like what we're doing in our industry, like our industry is growing so fast that even with, you know, like the people on this live stream and there's others out there that are doing great things, you know, motion hatch and 3d for designers, yep. um, you know, people like that. Um, there's not enough of us yet. I mean, we we still can barely keep up with like the amount of students and, and stuff that want to learn this stuff. Um, and you know, we're not good at doing the type of training Mike is doing. We're not great at doing the type of training Nick is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're good at the type of training we're doing. And I really think there's room for everybody. So I, I know this doesn't make it as interesting uh, for the audience that we're not, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to, but really like I, 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 I look, you know, I'm competitive and I look at what they do and I'm like, oh, they did a really good job. Shoot. I wish we'd done that first. Um, but in terms of business and sales and all that, I, I don't, I don't really think that like we're cannibalizing each other to an extent where, you know, I'm losing sleep over it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's, I always look at what you guys do and, and take notes half the time. They're like, that's a really good idea. Thanks. Um, <laughs> and, but also just like these kind of things, we've had calls that aren't, you know, live broadcast either where we all get, get on and, and talk about, you know, what's working and what's not working. And for me, it's, it's about having these options. What's really cool about having, you know, different personalities that have different teaching styles is that now the consumer and the customer and the, and the, and the student can choose between what makes sense for them. So if you're the, you know, if you're the type of person that uh, has to like cram in a weekend, like, oh crap, I need to know Redshift by Monday, you can come grab, you know, our training and do that. But if you're somebody that's like, okay, I finally want to learn animation and I want to dedicate, you know, weeks of my, of, of my time to it. And I really want to nail it down and have somebody like give me feedback, you know, you know, like a more, um, uh, a course from, um, uh, school of motion could be a perfect example. So, uh, and then again, like what you're doing too, Chris, like the, the, the more soft skills and the, the way that you teach typography and, and, and get people ready for actual design, all this stuff is needed. And so to me, it's less about competition between us. And it's more about the, the student out there that can come and say, okay, I'm ready finally to, to learn typography. I, I now am ready to go, um, tackle that monster. And, and Chris is there to help you. Um, and then they can jump into our world and go crazy with cinema 4d and jump mm-hmm. into all of our worlds. And, and, you know, you brought up that, that slide earlier with, with the amount of money that traditional schooling costs, 
you can get one of everything from us for less than a semester, right? Uh, yeah. I don't know everyone's prices, but um, it's pretty close. Like, like you can go crazy with one semester of budget. You can go out and get almost everything and subscribe to all the uh, ongoing memberships and you can build your own school um, as a student. And that's what's really interesting um, about having different options. It's less about um, competition and it's more about having different people there when you need them. Okay. I think it's starting to get juicy right now. Yeah. Thank you for opening it up, Nick. Okay. I can't say for Nick because I don't know all your products and, and classes, but I think I can say for Joey, myself, and Michael that if you bought everything that we make, it's still, I think, less than one semester at one of these private schools. Yeah. I'm pretty sure of it. So you can have everything that we make, all three of us, <laughs> and with the exception of Nick, because maybe Nick has a lot of products out there. And so that's going to make you think a little bit. Okay. So maybe we're not really competing against each other because there's a much bigger pie out there. And that's where all the students are going if they're going to these private schools. So do you guys have thoughts on what private school, private design school is doing wrong and what they're doing right? I do. Okay. Let's open it up, Joey. <laughs> Here we go, guys. I'm going to choose ready. my words carefully. Okay, I've gotten yeah. in trouble for saying stuff. On do not topic. choose your words but carefully. Just I'm gonna, speak I'm gonna, from the heart, Joey. I do want to be fair. Okay. So first I want to clear one thing up. So the, the, um, the number that you threw out at the beginning, that 350,000, I just want people to understand yes, where that please. comes from. Cause really, you know, uh, I've taught, I taught for one year at, at a private art school Ringling. Um, and so it's not a ton of experience, but I've, I've seen the inside. I know how it works. So, um, if you, the, you know, it's great. You can go on all of these colleges, you know, Otis and Art Center um, and Pratt and RISD, and you can look at their prices. And if you go on RISD's, there's actually a pretty detailed price list of tuition, room and board, all the extra fees that get tacked on. And it's 70K a year all in to go to RISD right, right now. It will be probably higher in the future. You add all that up, that's $280,000. If you have to take out loans for, say, half of that, and with the interest, it ends up costing $350,000. So that's the total price tag for RISD. Now, I wanna start by saying that maybe that's worth it. Maybe it is, right? Like I didn't go to RISD, I didn't go to art school. Um, and when I, I went to Boston University and it did not cost even half that much back then. Um, and so the question I think students, you know, thinking about going to these schools should be asking is, am I gonna get that much value out where it's worth it, right? And obviously everyone comes from a different situation um, if you can pay for it or if you get grants or scholarships that make it way more affordable, it's, I mean, it's a, it's the Cadillac of education to go to a place like that. I can tell you going to Ringling is amazing. Yes, um, it is. You know, yes. Especially right. Erica, one of my old students that works for the sophomore future. Sophomore <laughs> year, you were the best thing at 830 in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, woke, you woke me up. I don't know about everybody else, but it was it great. Was, it was the coffee and the Red Bull. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so, so to get back to your question, Chris, I think, you know, what schools like RISD and like Ringling and SCAD, I mean, what they, they're clearly doing something really, really, really right. Because, you know, I was at the, the Control Z party in L.A. a couple of weeks ago, and there was this real running being projected on the side of the building. And every other, you know, after every little piece, there'd be a credits list and there were ringling students all over it, SCAD students all over it. OK, School of Motion students are out in the industry doing amazing things. Um, but we're you know, you're not seeing as many proportionally um, as these top tier art schools getting into the bucks and the giants and the places like that. Um, and so in, in terms of like producing like great artists and, and, you know, also I think recruiting and, and, and bringing in recruiters and doing job placement, um, they're doing amazing. And again, it just comes back to the question, is it worth the price tag? One of the things I think they really are going to have to focus on is leveraging the advantages that they have because those advantages are shrinking. Um, one of the big things about online is that now economics, the economics of it are that you can get Gordon Ramsay to teach a cooking class. It's worth his time because of, you know, the scalability of it. Um, we have a class coming out with uh, Sonder Van Dyke as the teacher. He's one of the best After Effects animators in the world. And it wouldn't have made sense for him to go, you know, take a 75% pay cut and go teach at a college. But online it does. And so, uh, you know, in terms of the quality of the faculty, it's harder and harder to compete with online um, in terms of, you know, the ability to play videos at double speed and pause things and add markers and rewind and not feel stupid if you didn't get something the first time. 
that's another advantage. Um, but what we don't have online is the ability to sit in a room and have that connection. Like Michael was talking about that messy human connection, which is really awesome and, and a great experience. Um, and so one of the things I could tell you um, that my old boss at Ringling, who's super forward thinking, he is probably still trying to do this because it never quite caught on. But, you know, doing the thing where you flip the classroom and you have uh, the lessons are presented in video form. And then you have like three hours to sit with your small group of students and jam on stuff and ask questions and get one on one help. And that's an advantage that we don't have and won't have probably ever because we're online. Um, and so I would be doubling down on that if I if I was uh, running those institutions. Perfect. Thanks yeah. so much. I think you said that very succinctly and carefully, not to uh, overtly offend anybody. Uh, <laughs> does somebody else want to throw <laughs> a Molotov cocktail on this? Because I want to get the party started. Yeah. I mean, I I could um, I I could say about my school experience was not good. So I went I okay. went to one of the AI schools, um, mm. and it was very expensive. And um, I, I, however, I do think it, it is similar to a lot of people's school experience. As I talk to more and more people that go to school, no matter where you go, you, you tend to connect with one or two teachers that really give you so much value and almost make it worth it, even at a high price tag. Just having those one or two teachers or, or meeting those one or two people in school, uh, you can look back and say, okay, that, that, was, that was worth it. Um, but... Uh, the the things about school that I didn't like were the actual, like the classroom stuff, right? The the, the actual, uh, the, the the way that a teacher would stand in front of the class and say, "This is what we're learning today," and whoever what it here's what's here's what frustrated me about school it, for the most part, whoever was learning the slowest got the most attention, and I think that that's a broken model that we had to deal with when the internet wasn't around, that when videos weren't around, and we just had to make sure that everybody was up to date. And there, there wasn't like, go, go, you know, catch yourself up at home by watching these tutorials. And so, uh, and I should say, sometimes I was the dummy in class that held everyone else up as well. But it always was the, the person that was the slowest learning that held up the class and it, and it stopped progression as far as the time in the classroom. Um, so what I think, what I think is interesting about the online model is that it allows you to push ahead as fast as you want if you're ready. But it also, like you said too, Chris, it allows you to pause and rewind it and let me try that again and let me hear again how they explained it or go ask a question and then revisit the video later. And so, to me, um, you know, what what are they doing right? I think what they're doing right is they're putting a bunch of people in a room and a bunch of entertaining, well, I'll, I won't say entertaining, I'll say interested, uh, creative people, they're putting them in a room and allowing them to make connections. That is something that is very hard to do online. It's something that, you know, I see you guys are trying to build into your class, giving that human element. Um, but to me, it's just not there yet to do it through a video camera. Like even the discussions that we've had, we, I've met a lot of you in person, I think all of you in person now, um, we have a much deeper connection when we're face to face and we're, you know, like standing at a, at a corner of a bar or something like that than we are even through this video. So I think we have a long way to go to get to that person in person experience. And so what I, what I think schools will always like for a long time have is that ability to bump in and, and randomly meet somebody that can really carry you to the next part of your career. And so the way that we think of it is we're going to, we're going to give you as much video content as possible that you can watch at any time at any speed and you can move ahead and, and stay behind if you want. And we're there when you need it. And then we encourage our students uh, to get the heck out from behind their computer and go into a real room situation and go to an event. I'm going to take that, that budget again, that you, that we're talking about the 20, 20, 30 K a semester and say, you can actually like get a flight and go to some of these events and go to these meetups and meet people that are doing this for a living, no matter where you live. Um, and so that to me is kind of the analogy for the, the classroom the, for the physical classroom that how we're trying to solve it um, and, and flip the classroom in that way, give you plenty of video content and then encourage you to go meet other people that do this for a living, go to, to your local meetup, 
go make a local meetup if you don't have one. Go to these larger events, NAB, Seagraph. Um, the, the party in LA was a good example. I'm so bummed I wasn't there. It was good. We miss but, you, man. Uh, we miss you. <laughs> so bummed. But, um, you know, to me, the it's clear that maybe this is the, it's not quite the bomb you wanted, Chris, but to me, it's very clear that traditional education is broken. And I'm so glad Woo. that there are options. All right. And uh, I, I'm excited to be a part of the options mm -hmm. to do that. I'm excited. You guys are out like trying to find out where this is because it's, it's it clear to me that this is the future. Great name, by the way. This is the future. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and that is going to be continue to be the old school way to do things. Yeah. I, I think in a world where we think of things as black and white, there's more grayscale involved. And I'm just... That's why you're good. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they pay me the big bucks. That's, that's right. That's, that's why. why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So much I, I want to get into this. Michael, uh, if you have additional thoughts, but I also want to let our audience that are tuning in right now live because they're asking... When do we get to ask questions? You get to ask questions right now, anytime, all the time. Matthew yeah. and Greg are looking at the questions. If you come up with a good question that's on topic, Matthew will signal to me like, hey, I got a question. So Matthew. We got some. We got some. Let's let's fire oh, yeah. that up. And and Michael, I didn't forget about you. If you want to talk about it too, uh, I'm happy to have you chime in on this. Okay, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, so I think a lot of the people on here who did go to traditional school, and I share this position as well, is that what you get in school is that camaraderie. You have people that are also uh, enthusiastic about learning and growing, and you have a built-in network there that you're, um, that you're growing with. Mm -hmm. So there's something to that that I personally really enjoyed, whereas some people feel like when they learn online, they have a certain level of isolation where they're not as connected. Of course, digital tools and things like that are helping us connect. So. I guess the question is like, what, what can people do to build that network that's, that will supplement that face-to-face -face thing that you have inside the classroom? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Nick just, met, Nick just talked about that. I think he talked about going to meetups, creating your own meetup, mm -hmm. going to conferences, and there's tons of conferences everywhere where you, I think there's a myth that it's actually a lot harder to, to go out and meet people and to network. If you went to that party that people threw, I don't know how many people showed up, a couple hundred people. If you went to the Ben Design Conference, 470 people were there. And you get to meet people from, from a variety of uh, d disciplines, different age groups, different states in their career. It's pretty awesome. And right. the community is a lot more open and receptive than you might think. Even more so than in school, Matt, because I always got the feeling when I was in school, there was a level of competition. Yes. The camaraderie yeah. you're talking about, yes, I see in some schools, but it's like, oh, I'm not going to tell you where I got my fonts from, or I'm not going to show you the secret resource I have, because right. they're afraid. They're afraid that you're going to walk in the room and do something similar or better than they did. So right. there was a little bit of that, right? It was kind of the opposite for me. Everybody was so excited. It's like, yeah, I just saw this cool new thing. You want to see? It's like, yeah, sure. And then they show it to you, and then you can do it yourself. So I guess you guys went to design school, and I actually went in the motion design program. So mm -hmm. there was a mix of animation and design, so it might be different in that sense as well. That's probably why. Right. And I, you know, I just ask for the audience, not because I, I, I agree Nick did cover that, but I think there is a, a, there's like a granular level that you get seeing the same person at the same time working on the same ex exact assignment as you, and then you have that level of competition, Chris. Uh, I don't know if you felt it in, in class, but for me at Art Center, I'm a highly competitive guy, and when I saw you know, the top performers in my class, I would always try to outdo them. And for me, like I always enjoyed that structure within uh, brick and mortar school. And I, it's hard to see that same level of competition or camaraderie online. I will say though, of all the communities that I am a part of in terms of the broad graphic design community and all the other ones that we see out there, I feel like the motion design community, once you're plugged in, is very friendly, yeah. very giving, especially online. But I don't know that it necessarily mimics or emulates what you do get in the classroom. So that's one thing that I'm just, it, it's, it, I feel like it's very nuanced and I'm just trying to dig down in there if there's any other ways that we can supplement that. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. It, it's it's um, of course there's new tools like Slack and you know there's online communities that you could join. But you're right, it 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 doesn't give you that same 
you know, rubbing shoulders with somebody and being competitive, but also being creative with them and bouncing ideas off of each other. That that is a tough thing. So uh, to me, any time that you can be in an actual room with somebody that is um, competitive with you or better than you, uh, that's to me the only way I could see to do it. It's it's so difficult online to create these uh, these relationships right now. And so I, it, it's not perfect. It depends on where you live. It depends on how many people around you are doing this, but try to find a way. Maybe it doesn't have to be as specific as like motion design, but go try to find a way that you can be around other people that have that thing that school does do very well, which is have people around you that are passionate about something that want to maybe share with you or maybe be competitive with you. Both of those energies are kind of two <laughs> sides of the same coin. You know, it's like when you're like we just said here, you know, we're all we all share and we talk. But then when somebody does something a little bit better than the other or like a, a somebody names a product really well or whatever, you know, we're all like, Damn. you know, so <laughs> like, you're, you're revealing something here, Nick. Yeah. Or like, you know, uh, you know, Chris, Chris's uh, thumbnails are, are, are killing it. I'm like, dang. No, that Tell me about it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Talk about this weekly. <laughs> so, you know, so that that energy is is two sides of the same coin it doesn't it doesn't mean we're we're angry it's it's a creative passionate energy that drives you to try to be better so however you can find that and some people are more of a loner they want to stay in their room uh and and to me i'm always pushing to try to find a way to get them away from the the, rec, the glowing rectangle in front of them and get them around people mm -hmm. because uh, there's really no substitute for that right now. I, but maybe there will be. Maybe the VR stuff will figure this out. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's getting to conferences, going to meetups, going to um, learn how to be a, a, a public speaker, like go to a local Toastmasters thing, like find something local that you want to that is somewhat related to what you're trying to learn and go be in that room. I, I always say this to students and and I try to do it myself as well is like try not to be the smartest one in the room. And that's really easy to do when you're alone by yourself in your, 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 your little creative space. So always try to find a way to go be uh, one of the dummies in the room because that's how you learn. That's how you meet other people. And that's how you find other people that are willing to share their journey and be a part of it as well. Yeah, Matt, I think what you just brought up was there's a gap between what online can offer right now given technology and what you get when you go to an in-person college. Um, and I mean, it, you know, I, I can't even imagine how we could recreate the experience of being up all night in the computer lab with your friends and ordering pizza and you know, <laughs> someone's got a flask and, and it's like, you know, I mean, and that, that's the stuff that like you want, right? I mean, and it's really, this, that's the stuff you remember. You don't remember the one After Effects lecture. So I guess the, the question is, that I hope we start asking ourselves and, and our children start asking themselves is how much is that worth? Because I do think that you, you can say, well, it's priceless to have those experiences, but there becomes a point where it's not. And so that's why, and actually this is where Michael should chime in because Michael actually has this really interesting new project he's doing, which I think may attempt to bridge this, this gap a little bit and, you know, offer the same sort of scalable cost effectiveness of doing things using technology, but then also having an, a live component that's built in a way that doesn't depend on enormous tuition payments. Um, and, and it's more affordable because it's more streamlined and it's really about how do we connect like-minded artists and creative people in a room? Michael? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Perfect yeah, setup for yeah. you, Michael. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. And, um, you know, I think you know, I'm a believer that the hybrid model is the future, kind of like Nick was saying of um, the worst part of the existing experience is that a human being would stand up and give the same, here's how the graph editor works and here's, um, you know, how to do key framing or here's design principles. Um, when that stuff probably should be, you know, turned into a video, but uh, the last, you know, five, six years has also made me a big believer that it really is a world apart. The experience that you get at a traditional institution where if you're going to do four years, you know, attending every single day, being in that environment um, is a formative experience. So I think there's like the issue of 
cost. I think a lot of these institutions exist as kind of monopolies. They have like a monopolistic position where, you know, it'd be really hard to start another Ringling right now, right? Like in like in the same market, it would be almost impossible to do that. Given you know, we, that's that's a, lo a longer conversation, but. Um, there is no price competition. And then we also have the, the problem of a third party payer in which people don't really have to pay, um, you know, everything up front, right? If, if you didn't have these subsidized loans where, you know, you have the federal government basically promising lenders, hey, if this, if this loan goes bad, we'll make you whole. It removes the lending discipline out of the equation. Like if you go apply for a mortgage, they want to see how are you going to pay for it? Do you have a job? Like they really vet your ability to pay that back relative to what you're paying. What is, you know, what is it worth in the marketplace? They do all of this kind of underwriting analysis uh, that just doesn't happen in higher education. So every single year, 3%, 5%, 6%, the price goes up and up. Um, however, like that's a problem. Somebody needs, we need to figure out how to fix that problem. At the same time, every young person should be able to go attend a traditional institution and have that formative experience. Um, I, I really do believe that. I think because, sure, you're learning a trade, you're learning how to do motion design. However, you are at a liberal arts institution where you are also asked to study other things to make you a more well-rounded human being. Um, the liberal arts in the traditional sense emerged as um, liberal arts was worthy of a free person. You are a, a free person in a society where you get to uh, pick your representatives. And we have an election coming up here in the United States. Please go vote, I would say, if you're in the United States. Um, the idea is that you are more than just your ability to do design and animation. And a lot of these institutions do believe in that still. And I, I tend to believe in that a lot as well. Um, now that's great. I agree with Joey, but like, what is that worth? There is a point where you shouldn't ruin your entire financial future to have that, to have that experience. And that is, um, you know, precisely why I'm trying to build a brick and mortar alternative, um, here in Sarasota. I think it's a great kind of case study to be around the corner from, from an institution like Ringling where, you can have personalized learning. People can be on their own tracks. They don't have to, like Nick was saying, be held back by kind of the slowest person in the room. Um, but at the same time, being able to experience a group setting that does kind of inspire you. And I think there's even good science, like your physiology changes when you're sitting next to other human beings versus just sitting by yourself um, in your, you know, alone in your room. So I think for all sorts of reasons. And, you know, I think I was even giving Nick like the hard sell when we were drinking beers in Vegas of saying, Nick, go buy a building in Detroit and do <laughs> the same thing. Build an on the ground institution. You're so successful and you would be so amazing at it uh, because I am kind of on this crusade that like we need new alternatives. We need to bring some price competition um, into this space, but real competition like MoGraph Mentor is not a real alternative to Ringling School of Art and Design. It's it's, you know, a, a one one hundredth slice of what you get at a traditional institution. So I think we're at the beginning of this, but I think, you know, interesting things could emerge. Mm, okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm going to weigh in on this. And here goes my tirade. I've been busy jotting down some notes here. So you guys get ready for this part. Um, Michael, I love how you said that, that there, there needs to be some competition for these institutions because it does appear at times that they do have a lock. I'm not sure I would call them a monopoly, but they do have a lock that it seems like for many students and parents of those students that that's the only path moving forward. So I look at this, and this may be me self-aggrandizing us a little bit, but I believe that organizations like us and Motion Hatch and all these other resources that are out there serve as a check and balance to the system. And what strikes me as crazy, and I'm sure you guys have experienced things like this, where somebody comments in one of our videos and they say, unsarcastically, that they've learned more from this one video than a whole year at uni. First of all, I know that they're European because it said uni. <laughs> so that means that we're reaching all across the planet to people in, in little nooks and crannies where they can't even have access to this kind of stuff because that's not even within the realm of possibility. So I created a graph here. Let me pull up this graphic here. So I said that um, this, this is a Venn diagram that's all skewed, that you have three people that you need to serve. Students, most importantly, 
teachers and the institution. And the way I see private art school and education right now is it serves itself. It's not giving the students the best bang for the buck. It's not adopting to new technologies, new ways of learning. It's not tailoring the experience for the individual. Conversely, Joey was talking about this for teachers. It does seem insane that you're going to take a gigantic pay cut and teach. And that's a sacrifice many teachers have to make. I think that's such a tragedy. And one of the reasons that I'm motivated to do what we do is I want to change this formula. So I want it to be more equitable. So now check out this graph here. So now what we're looking for is that perfect cross section inside the Venn diagram. And I had this conversation before, so I'm not just freestyling this. What do students want? They want the best, most dynamic teachers. They want to learn in the most dynamic environment. They want to be amongst some of the most talented and competitive people so that they learn from each other. What do teachers want? Well, teachers want something very similar. They want the best students because it sucks to teach a class when the students are not motivated to learn. But what they need is they need flexibility. They can teach when they want to teach, how they want to teach, and not have to fall into a very structured system. They should also be paid for their intellectual property. And I know this is a crazy thing, but that's the model we're trying to build so that if we build the community up and, and the, the portal, if you will, where teachers can do this, then they're going to be rewarded. And the institution wants to do social good, I believe. It's not just about building more buildings, but to do something good for humanity. And I think that's really the reason why schools exist. But we need to figure that out. And right now, it's totally lopsided. It's more like, oops, never mind. It's more like this than it is like this. It, it exists to serve itself and to build more buildings with more halls that we don't need. Now, we're going to have Seth Godin on our show in a little bit, like in a couple of days. Seth Godin has the, 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 the blueprint, the plan already mapped out. And, and Michael, you touched on this already. You should record a lecture from the most dynamic, most charismatic, most engaging teacher. And they're not all created equal. So that should be recorded and you should watch the lecture at home and you should do your homework at school. That makes a lot of sense. And you're right. You do need to have some physical space for people to congregate and do something. So Michael, I'm going to be watching very intently as to how you develop your program. We are also going to be experimenting with this ourselves. We have the space, we have brick and mortar, we have plenty of room, and we're gonna start doing this. We're gonna bring people in, we're gonna teach, we're gonna start putting cameras everywhere, the VR stuff to help everybody else learn amongst the students. And I like this idea. I like this idea that schools should exist to serve the students, that the students can learn something, have valuable skills that then they in turn can make money, and then perhaps after they make the money, they go back and buy some courses. I like that model. I know it's a little um, ideal. Uh, what is that called? Um, it's a little idyllic, and that maybe idealistic. It's idealistic, and maybe a little uh, socialist. But I just believe that we can all help each other. We can, and we can all profit from it as well. Okay, um, Greg, I, Matthew, another question or comments? Yeah, I, I got a good transition question. Uh, since we were coming off of the difference between online and brick and mortar and uh, obviously all of us here are building our own courses and kits and everything like that how do we and this is a question from zachary he's been asking for a while like how do we make sure that the content that we're making the classes we're making is actually marketable and relevant and i'm just wondering maybe if we could go around to see it like what the process is for each of you guys to know that what you're going to make is actually going to be marketable for the student, the person who's purchasing it. How do we know that they are going to get that uh, return on their investment? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, good question. Uh, I can jump in. I think, you know, the way we do it, and this is one of the um, this is one of the cool things about having an online business is that you can be so niched. You know, like you can really focus on this one narrow vertical like and your tribe doesn't have to be millions of people but we can't all have giant audiences like like the future but uh you, you know you don't have you don't have to please everybody you can just focus on what you know and so the way that we've started and basically continued uh is just by scratching our own itch what are the things that i you know 10 years ago wished really like deep in my heart that there had been a class to teach me um and so i think that like that's really a good place to start um, and then, it, you know, we sort of, the way School of Motion developed, we had an audience before we had classes. And so you, you can de develop an audience by giving away things for free, exactly like, you know, Grayscale Gorilla did. Um, and people, you know, like fosters goodwill. And then you can just ask people, 
What are you having trouble with? What do you want to learn? And you always have to balance what do you want to learn with what do you actually need to know? Because no one's going to say, well, I really want to learn, you know, the fundamentals of, uh, you know, how renderers work, right? They, they're going to want to know, like, how do I make really cool particle stuff, right? And it's easy to sell that stuff. Uh, but you also, if you're trying to do justice to your audience, you want to teach them how the graph editor works too and stuff like that. Um, so it's a combo. I think there's a natural weeding out process, you guys. Joey, Michael, and Nick wouldn't be here if they made products that didn't return value, that it was a poor ROI. And so you can just see that. So the cool thing is you don't ever have to take a class because you're forced to because it fulfills a requirement, especially from one of us. You could just ask around, did you get value from that? Who bought this class? Was it good for you? And generally speaking, the word of mouth will tell you what to do. So if you see a program that's out there that it seems priced too high or priced too low and you're suspicious, just poke around. I mean, you want to acquire the knowledge. It will cost you something. Here's what I look at. I'm not selling you a product to learn topography or to nego negotiate against a client. I'm not. I'm just selling you your time back to you at a higher price. What does that mean? You could go out there. You could read the manual. You can dig around and cobble together 35 different resources and watch 10 videos online. But what you've spent now is months, if not longer, trying to figure out the material. So at some point, you're going to realize my time is worth more than that. I would rather pay someone who's done it, who can teach the materials to me, and buy my time back. That's all we're doing. We're just selling your time back to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that too. I, I think, um, you know, Chris, you, you said it best with asking around and, and seeing what the value actually is. I think part of the reason we have, you know, a lot of, of free tutorials is so that you can learn how we teach and learn the, the process of what we do and, and kind of Tr see if we're a good fit before you um, before you give us money, right? So that's one part of it. It's just like, okay, I like the way they teach. They, you know, we, we do a lot of starting from scratch, kind of going, trying to go through the whole process. And if you like that and you like my personality and that I wave my hands around a lot, maybe you, you probably like our uh, training. Um, and of course, we also have you know, like, what, what, what I don't see in, in traditional schooling is um, uh, money back guarantees. So, you know, you could always, uh, for many online products, I don't know everyone's exact return policies, but there's always so many, uh, we have 60 days. If it's not providing you value, we don't, we don't even ask you why, yeah. uh, just return it. I love that. And so I think that's also what's interesting about online is that you could take chances and you can look at that 20 to 30 K a semester and, and, and cut it in half and then take that money and put it, put it on a, a lot of different things and see what you learn from many different parts of the of the of the internet and to get to to talk really briefly too about the joey said you know how do you decide if it's something you want to learn or something you should learn and that's something that um i personally went through a lot like i personally learned as much as i could about after effects i bought all the dvds i could and i went to all the classes and it wasn't until i was really working in the industry when i realized like why does my work look so ugly? <laughs> like mm. it, it's animated so well. I knew, I knew all about the curves and I knew all about everything, but I would go get the color picker and go all the way up to the right and not know that that like, you should not pick the fully saturated green and orange every time you want. And so, you know, I wasn't forced to learn that stuff. And so, you know, what we try to encourage on our training and, and our, our, everyone in our, um, uh, teaching roster is to do what we call chocolate covered broccoli, which is like <laughs> teach what they want to learn. Like you all want to learn this cool new, uh, you know, technique that where things explode and then blood drips down and all that stuff. We'll teach you that for sure. But in the middle of that, we're going to tell you why we picked this typeface and we're going to tell you why we chose this color. We want to tell you why we slowed the camera down right at the end and then added this like nice little subtle thing. And so there's, um, there's different ways that you can approach it. So to me, those kind of things add to the value. And once you see, once you go sign up for a course and you see like, okay, they, they did what they said they would do, which is teach me this thing or whatever the course, uh, told you that I think that trust is just a part of the process. So we take it very seriously. We don't, we don't just put out, you know, more videos of us, you know, rambling on for, for 20 hours. We really get to the point of what, we, what we know you want to learn, but also sprinkle in some of the things that you should learn as well, like design and 
animation fundamentals, those things. Right. And I, I wanted to chime in on this and why I've always enjoyed watching your stuff, uh, Nick, and everybody else that I feel like is just so giving right now is that you especially have always been kind of reactive to what you see on in the market. So what I like about a lot of the free content that's online and free versus what's in the classroom, the classroom is very rigid. Here's the foundation. Here's what we've been teaching for the past five years. And they just go over that cycle over and over and over mm -hmm. again versus all the free uh, online coin t uh, content is very reactive. Hey, there's this cool Nike commercial or there's this cool Xbox commercial. Let me show you how they probably did it. And they would break that down. And obviously, because somebody's or a client has paid that studio or that individual money to make that thing, you know that it's market viable right at this moment. And that's what I love about a lot of the people that share their tutorials online for free. So you know that it's marketable. So what Matthew, what you're saying, because first I was confused at the beginning, what you're saying is the problem with traditional programs at school is they're already drastically, massively, completely out of date. And a lot of them are just mm -hmm. teaching you from the manual, like here's how you do a curve. I've actually never applied this to our actual real client. And that's why when you get out of school, especially from some of these lower tier schools, not any that we mentioned on that in the beginning of the show, is you get out and you're like, why does my stuff look like butt? It just is so bad. It's because they taught you technically what to do, but they didn't teach you what real professionals are doing. So once you sit next to somebody that actually knows what they're doing about compositing or how to finesse an animation, then you're like, oh my gosh, that's a massive jump from where we are today. So what, what Nick and Joey and, and Michael are doing is they're applying ideas, techniques, and process that are relevant right now, right here today, and teaching it to you almost in real time as they're learning it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're you're bringing up um, another another point about all this is we've talked about this as a traditional school as you know maybe just getting started and going to college and doing your two three four years but in an industry like design and especially in 3D animation and and uh, well as well yeah in almost any of these animation um, uh, things to learn there's new stuff every year like the learning doesn't stop. And so this idea that you can go to school and get all you need, no matter how good the school is, is, is um, not only outdated, but just not how the industry works. We all know there's new tools and new software and new plugins and new techniques too that our clients are asking for. Mm -hmm. So the way that we look at a lot of our training is less geared toward that super beginner of just getting started. Um, and honestly, we have a lot of free stuff that gets you ramped up and ready to go. We have, you know, hours and hours of free Cinema 4D tutorials, After Effects tutorials to get you up and, and excited and to the point to where now, once you're working in the industry, once you have a client, once you're a freelancer, now, okay, now we know you need to learn Redshift and you can come get hours of that and 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 pay to, 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 to join us. So it's it's just that point of, ongoing learning and i think that's also what gets me excited about this this like this internet online learning re revolution is is the ability to uh like see something that you want to learn and just go learn it you don't have to go back to school right you can mm -hmm. go back to school right here on your computer that's right all right uh, i read some comments here i just want to give some testimonials to both of you guys or but not to both of you guys, or two of you guys in particular. Hello, I'm Flo, says that he just wanted to give a testimony to Nick. He said he created a design conference four years in a row in his town in Belgium, thanks to Nick and his shared motivation. So thank you from Flo. What's up, Flo? <laughs> Good to see you, man. There's awesome. somebody else here who's like, I read Joey's book, uh, The Freelancer Manifesto, and he loved it. So thank you, Joey, for doing that. I'm still scanning here. Maybe somebody will throw out something from Michael, but I'm not egging you. You guys can say whatever you want. Do we have another question, you guys? We have another... 10 minutes here before we have to wrap up this live stream. Uh, I think there's just one quick one and okay, everybody, it's just a yes or no question uh, because we haven't addressed it. Do college diplomas still matter in motion design? Whoa, <laughs> that is not a that's, little softball that, question. That, that's binary. It's a yes or no. Okay. Let's yes or quick. no. Okay. Gentlemen, let's go down the line. Uh, Joe, you're up first. No. <laughs> you didn't even let me ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Campbell, you're up next. No. Okay, Michael Jones, are you going to be the minority voice here? 
Um, it does matter to certain companies and corporations, yes. Some companies will only hire someone with a BFA. If you want to go on and teach at an institution later, you have to um, typically have an MFA. So, you know, what does it validate? Probably, um, you know, that you can complete an undergraduate program. But um, as far as I understand, still very large uh, companies do require a degree. So, so I would say it depends. Okay, yes with an asterisk. And I'm going to say... Over. <laughs> I'm going to say most definitely, no, <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, give me another question, Matthew. I like that. Short and sweet. Yeah. Uh, hold on. I got to dig up a couple. I, I... Okay. Greg, what about you or, or Erica? You guys have a good question. Not a too lengthy question because we do need to wind down the show here. Uh, let's see. We're digging around here. You say digging around, right? Digging around. Digging, <laughs> digging. Enunciate, my friend. Yeah. Like, okay. All right. Digging around. Well, I'm going to ask the guys. Well, do you guys have one? No, not, not yet? yet? Not yet. Okay. So I'm going to ask you guys, what are your biggest challenges? Let's look forward into 2019. At the end of 2019, you're going to have to overcome certain things to continue to grow. What is it that you need to overcome? Whoever wants to take that in any order. Uh, I'll go. Um, you know, our industry, 3D animation uh, and and motion design in general is just full of new techniques, new software, new hardware. I mentioned, you know, I'm moving to, to a, a Windows machine. That's an entirely new win learning process for me. And I just don't see that slowing down. There's AR and there's VR and there's video games. There's all this stuff. So for us as as a as a company and and as, you know, trying to, to, to be the best educators we can, our, our challenge is to try to teach a very splintered um, uh, world. So, you know, we talked a little bit about Redshift, but there are like, you know, half a dozen to a dozen different renderers alone that people are jumping to and trying and trying to stay ahead of that stuff. So, you know, we have some ideas here coming soon in, in early 2019 that I hope will solve this. Um, but that's been our biggest challenge is, is trying to be there um, for wherever the motion designer goes, which is, you know, for us, that's the end goal. Wherever the motion designer is going, whether, whether it's different software, whether it's different techniques, you know, Grayscale Gorilla wants to be there to help you learn it. So that, that's probably our biggest, biggest uh, challenge for, for next year. Fantastic. Who's up next? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, I've got a really big challenge. Um, going forward with building this this brick and mortar hybrid uh, model which um, it's easy to kind of theorize and things uh, sound good and, and it seems like a great idea but um, the day-to-day -day of advertising a brick and mortar business in a totally new market where i don't have any existing um, kind of presence or credibility i can already see um, is going to be a really big challenge i'm um, working as hard as I can, you know, I'm like setting up booths at uh, college fairs next to the likes of Ringling and uh, Full Sail and, you know, I was right next to Full Sail at the last college fair and they just had this massive poster that was essentially the Avengers film poster, like the cover of the, uh, you know, like the movie poster. And they were just like, oh yeah, our grads, uh, they worked on this, they made this. And, they're, you know, students are blown away, holy crap, this is incredible. And then they come over to me, they're like, what's going on over here? I'm like, well, we have this new thing and, <laughs> uh, you know, it's very affordable. And uh, we're really trying to uh, innovate a new way and uh, protect your financial future. And I can see their, you know, 17 year olds don't care about the cost. I can already see that affordability is not, um, it does not move them. So I think even my marketing already has had to move to like, well, our, uh, our visual development instructor, she's at DreamWorks right now, and our character animation mm -hmm. uh, instructor is mm -hmm. at Disney, just worked on Wreck-It Ralph, like really having to pitch the larger vision of where they can go. Um, when initially I, to me being like 30 years old, it's like, oh, affordability is a great pitch. And 17 year olds like, do not care. So <laughs> uh, it's, it's they don't understand it yet. You know who does a really good job of that is Noman School. Have you guys been to the Noman School campus in Hollywood? Mm -hmm. I encourage all three of you guys to go visit Noman. They create a very compelling sales piece just by walking in there. It's designed yeah. as if a 22-year-old science fiction fan fantasy person built the campus. It is crazy. Their desks look like something straight out of the, the spaceship from Aliens. Mm -hmm. And they have posters and, and uh, statues from the big movies and they're just if if 
if Ringling or Full Sail has the Avengers, they have every movie, and that's how they combat it. And I can see now why they designed the school the way they did. It is a gigantic marketing masterpiece. Mm. So that's what you're competing against, Michael. Cool. Yes, indeed. Okay, Joey, what are your biggest challenges? Uh, we don't have any challenges. Uh, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. No, uh, so I, I'll, I, I'll echo what Nick said. Um, you know, like our industry moves very quickly. And so, um, you know, we, we're constantly having to revamp classes as things get updated. Um, and as we add more classes, that becomes a challenge. And I think the, the biggest challenge for us is now just sort of exploring, you know, we, we've kind of proven that our model of teaching and our platform and the way that, that we do things works really well. Um, and our students really like it and they get really good results from it. And so, you know, we're trying to expand, you know, we're, um, we launched our, our first 3D class this year um, and we're going to be launching more next year. And that's kind of a separate track from where we've been doing. And then there's other tracks that we're opening up. And so we're trying to figure out how to, you know, sort of on, on the fly build a curriculum that makes sense um, and how to lead students from beginning to end. Um, so that's, that's actually going to be a huge challenge, um, but pretty exciting one. Mm. Mike's, challenge, Mike's challenges seem way harder, to be honest. <laughs> they, they are. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you guys what our challenges are here at the future. Now, unlike you guys, we're kind of coming into this from a very different angle, having run a full-service design motion graphics and brand strategy company. And we're, we're, we're transitioning out of that. So for us, our biggest challenges are runway. It's just going to be really honest. Right now, we have about six months of runway, financially speaking, as we move out of doing client work and doing education products and courses 100% of the time. I believe we're going to get there. So right now, we just have to learn how to manage the content that we give away for free and the products and courses that actually make us money and to slowly step out of doing client work altogether because this is what we're really passionate about. We want to disrupt education as we know it. I think it's ready and it's time and we have the resources and the space to be able to do this. Joey, before I let you go, there was one special question just for you. Sure. Are you ready? Why <laughs> did you turn down lynda.com and did you make the right decision? Well, if I had known they were going to get bought by uh, you know LinkedIn and then Microsoft, then, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, so, uh, so, so the, very briefly, the story is that right before um, we launched our very first class, I was actually kind of in the throes of should I try and make a class and sell it. Um, I was approached by um, Rob from Linda, who's an awesome, awesome guy, and uh, and asked me if I wanted to make um, you know some animation content for Linda, and I was super honored because Linda is you know, an institution. I mean, I remember taking lynda.com classes and it's just been this giant thing in the industry forever. Um, but I had to make a choice between doing that, which I knew would take a lot of time or making my own thing. And I was just cocky enough at that time. To <laughs> if I do my own thing, this could yeah. work and, and then this could be my full-time job. Um, and so that was the decision I made. It was very difficult um, and, and it worked out, but I see Rob at conferences and stuff and, and Linda's Linda's doing okay, so don't worry. Didn't, didn't They're hurt. not hurting without <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems like you're doing just fine yourself, so everybody made the right decision, right? I hope so. We'll find out. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. All right. Now we're going to enter into the summary part of our show. Summary. Boom. Whoever is the slowest in school gets the most attention. For the price of one semester of private art school, you can buy everything that School of Motion, MoGraph Mentor, and the future makes. Think about it, people. Wow. And Grayscale Gorilla. Oh, well, Grayscale, they have a lot of products. Yeah. Uh, let me edit the slide later. Yeah. All right. We uh, yeah, we, we, won't, we won't break the budget, I promise. Okay, you won't break the budget. So basically, you can buy everything that we all make. So you guys definitely check that stuff out. Here's one of my biggest problems is teachers do not profit from the intellectual property. They should. This should be a mandate for all schools to consider. Online education allows for different types of learners, whether you go slow or fast or whatever it is, that is tailored more for you. Uh, private schools need competition, and I'm glad that I'm joined by my friends here that I've gotten to know that we're going to actually try to stir things up so that they have to pay attention and deliver a higher value to their students. We need hybrid schools, I think, that offer the best of both worlds. I'm glad that Michael's going to be leading that charge. We will be right behind you, Michael. And what we want to do is to flip the model. Flip the model. What do I mean by that? The lecture is watched at home and the homework is done at school. That makes the most sense to me. Traditional schools, brick and mortar schools can do that today. And we also know that not all classes are created equally. So you guys do your homework. And if you're not sure, buy a Grayscale Gorilla class because it's got a money back guarantee. 
That's if right, you don't baby. like it, think about that. When was the last time you attended a class at school and you didn't like the class? You're like, I'd like to get a refund. They're going to throw you out of school for saying that. All right. I wish I, I wish I could get a refund on a few of my, <laughs> my school classes. Right. I, I'm actually happy with my art school, uh, but I'm just uh, there weren't all the classes were not great. Okay, here we go. Last last little bit is the world design is moving fast and it's hard for rigid systems to adapt. Thankfully, there are people like us making content and kind of not only reacting but actually leading that charge. And Michael's problem is how do you compete against the Avengers? Good luck. Good luck. Uh, last but not least, market is fragmented. How do we continue to serve everyone? You guys, keep an eye out for Michael Jones, Nick Campbell, Joey Corman. See what they're doing. Watch what we're doing, and pay attention. And maybe and Chris Tell. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. I was just okay. saying I want to inc include you in there. <laughs> okay, you guys. Thank you very much for watching. This has been an episode live stream of Raw. If you guys want to get in touch with people on Twitter, it's School of Motion. It's Grayscale Gorilla 3D, so GSG 3D, and MoGraph Mentor. And you guys know us at The Future Is Here. Thank you very much, guys. Be sure you hit that like button, comment, and subscribe. 